why would Messiah come? Uh, and to address this, uh, I'd like to introduce to you my, my uh, friend and uh, my boss, uh, Dr. Mitch Glazer. Uh, it, it is great to be able to be with you, Dr. Glazer. And Dr. Glazer uh, is an alumnus of Talbot Theological Seminary. Uh, he has earned a PhD in intercultural studies from Fuller Theological Seminary in the School of Intercultural Studies. Uh, he is a co-author of many books, including the Fall Feasts of Israel, and, uh, and you can go to our website and you can pick one of these up. It's a wonderful book. And it's probably the statement on, fall, on the Fall Feast with he and his wife, Zahava, who have wrote and written that book. Um, he's also um, co-authored um, the, uh, To the Jew First, uh, The Gospel According to Isaiah 53, another excellent book, along with Michael Brown's in that book as well. Um, and the, the People, the Land, the Future of Israel, uh, Messiah and the Passover, uh, he has written a book called Isaiah 53 Explained, which has over 100,000 copies in print in 13 different languages. Uh, it's a, it's an, actually an amazing book. It's probably the first book that we give to, to those people who are, who are asking questions about, about Yeshua the Messiah, uh, people of the, the Jewish people. When they ask us questions about that, it's one of the first books we give is uh, this, this um, wonderful explanation of this amazing passage. Um, so uh, he is now, he's cu currently, and for the past 25 years, a president of Chosen People Ministries. Uh, and under his leadership, we have expanded to about 20 countries uh, around the world, to uh, scores of cities across North America, uh, in Canada and in America. Uh, he has uh, established the Charles Feinberg Center for Messianic Jewish Studies in the middle of Orthodox Jewish Brooklyn, uh, of which uh, I'm a professor uh, there, and, and he's one of our co-professors there and also our founder. Uh, and, uh, and he is, um, he is a native New Yorker of uh, Brooklyn. And, uh, and most importantly, uh, he's the guy that signs my checks. No, no, I, he's, he's my friend. And I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to share that with him, that Dr. Mitch Glazer, why don't you begin sharing? Well, good evening. Uh, thanks, Rich. And, uh, uh, it's my electronic signature, Rich. It happens automatically, so <laughs> you know, don't worry about it. It's all secure. Uh, we're putting up a PowerPoint right now as we take a look at one of the great, great passages in the Old Testament that uh, speaks about uh, the Messiah. And um, um, I'm just wondering if that should be expanded a little bit there. There we go. I got it. I got it. Yeah, it's good. And uh, I really loved uh, Michael Rodelnik's uh, clear, clear presentation. He's just such a, a clear Bible teacher. And if you have not read or you haven't really seen a copy of his book on Messianic prophecy put out by Moody Press, it is going to be the standard until Yeshua returns, at least in English. It's just a marvelous uh, piece of work. And uh, we're going to tackle one of those prophecies uh, right now. Why did uh, Messiah come? You know, you see that beautiful child uh, in nativity scenes and in the, in, in, in the Chosen's feature on the birth of Yeshua, uh, which a lot of us really like. And the baby looks so sweet and innocent. Uh, but I want to tell you two things about that baby. Number one, that baby is God wrapped in flesh, all-powerful, merciful, just, almighty. And secondly, I want to tell you that that little baby was born to die. And that baby needed to die. He needed to be God in the flesh, and he needed to die as a perfect sacrifice for our sin. And that is one of the most important truths that one can discover in reading both the Old and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we have the promise. In the New Testament, we have the fulfillment. And uh, one of my favorite uh, passages, which addresses this little dilemma of promise and fulfillment, uh, is in Luke chapter 24. So before we jump into Isaiah 53, real quickly, in Luke chapter uh, 24, we have this uh, a great passage where the, uh, there were these couple of uh, disappointed, despondent disciples on their way to Emmaus, and they're approached by uh, someone who is uh, 
kind of a stranger. And uh, we all know that it was Yeshua who was veiling his true identity from these men. And he said, why are you so depressed? Uh, and then they started explaining to him that they really hoped that this person, Jesus, was the Messiah who was going to overthrow the Romans and establish the Davidic throne. And instead he dies as a common criminal crucified by the Romans. He's placed in a tomb. And today is the third day, and some women went to the tomb, and they came back saying that he was gone. He was missing. And these, these fellows are totally disappointed. And just as they are at the height of their, if you know Yiddish, the height of their kvetching, uh, their complaining, uh, Yeshua said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And that's the promise and fulfillment that we're talking about. The prophets had spoken. And in verse 26 of Luke 24, was it not necessary for the Christ or the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? To suffer these things and enter into his glory. So there was a promise in the Hebrew scriptures that the messianic king would actually suffer. And then in verse 27, and this is the Bible study that I hope Jesus will teach again when we get to glory, because that's the, sun, that's the Sunday school or Shabbat school class that I want to join. The Old Testament according to Jesus. Can you imagine? I mean, that's going to be some course. So the scripture says, Luke says, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And we're making a little bit of an attempt during this Advent season to see Christmas through Jewish eyes and to see Advent through Jewish eyes, because it was Jewish people who wrote uh, down these great promises of God, these prophecies. And of course, they were fulfilled by the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, recorded by uh, actually Jewish disciples as well. In uh, verse 44, after Jesus uh, had shared a broiled fish meal uh, with the disciples, um, the discussion came back again uh, to who he was. And he said uh, to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, the three parts symbolically of the Torah, the Tanakh, the Torah, the five books, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketubim, the writings, and the Psalms are the ice, tip of the iceberg of the writings. And then he opened their, eye, their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, listen carefully, in verse 46 of Luke 24, thus it is written that the Messiah would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So these are promises that are found in a number of different places in the Hebrew scriptures, but there's no passage that is more clear and more specific than Isaiah chapter 53, written 700 years before Jesus ever came. And so we're going to take a look at Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, there's a debate as to where Isaiah 53 starts. You have to remember that there were no chapters and verses uh, at the time. And so Isaiah chapter 53 really begins in Isaiah chapter 52. I don't mean to confuse you, but again, there were no verses and no chapters uh, when the Old Testament was written. If you ever go to a synagogue and see the, uh, the Bible uh, read, you'll see it's, it's unfurled uh, on a scroll. And you have, to know, you have to know the notations within the scroll to know where to begin. And so there's some debate as to where Isaiah 53 uh, begins. But most people would suggest that it starts, the passage starts at 52.13. Now, this passage is 
called one of the servant songs of the Lord. Songs or psalms or passages that extol the virtues of the servant of the Lord. And there's one in Isaiah 42, one in Isaiah 49, another in chapter 50, and now one in chapter 52, 13, through the end of chapter 53. Also, just for your own information and for your understanding, I hope, the book of Isaiah is 66 chapters. And there, the, the book is usually divided into two major parts. Chapters 1 through 39 emphasize judgment. Chapters 40 through 66 emphasize the glorious future that God's prepared for Jewish people and the nations. And so judgment and then glory. Isaiah 53 is in the glory part of the book of Isaiah that begins in chapter 40 with the words, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. We're in the Christmas season. So uh, if you're going to go hear the Messiah sung, Handel's Messiah, you know that these, these, this portion of the Messiah is so precious. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. And so beginning at 40, ending at, at 66. So in a sense, Isaiah 53 is, is sort of the, the meat in the sandwich or the corned beef in the midst of the rye bread. It's, it's, it's the heart of this last passage. And though it may sound silly, there could be no second coming without a first coming. Now, what I mean is a little bit more than uh, math, although uh, I'd have to call Michael Rodelnik back to, with his calculator to help us figure this out. But you see, the first coming is the coming when Jesus died for our sins, the sins of the whole world, that allowed the second coming to happen because he came once to die for sin. And, and then he's coming another time to set up his throne and to reign as king. And those who embrace him as their savior will one day be able to welcome him as, his king, as their king. And so let's take a look briefly at the description of the servant in Isaiah 53, written 700 years before the first coming of Jesus, the Messiah. And again, we're beginning at verse 52, verse 13. Let me read it to you. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exhausted, exalted, maybe exhausted too. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of man. And so I'm going to take it a little bit uh, at a time, a little bit at a time. Um, this uh, passage in verses 13 through 14 are what I call an executive summary of the entirety of the next chapter. Almost everything you're going to learn in chapter 53 is in seed form in chapter 52, verses 13 through 14. So let me go through this fairly quickly because many people do not study this, but the entirety of the truths in chapter 53 are really found in this executive summary. So behold, my servant, the Hebrew word eved will prosper. My servant will prosper. Now, the only way to become a servant or a slave, same word, in the Old Testament was to lose your farm and indenture yourself to another Israelite. If you appreciated your new master, a fellow Israelite, after seven years, you could indenture yourself to that person for the rest of your life and put an earring in your ear as a symbol of your servitude to another Israelite. What's awesome is in Leviticus 25, we have the Jubilee year. And so it's interesting that in the 50th year, the, even if you had lost your farm, your kids or grandkids could get it back uh, because in the 50th year, it reverts back to its, own, its true owner. But one could become a servant. It's, it's not like they could get a part-time job at Starbucks, you know? There was no easy way to get out of servitude. 
And so if there's one thing we know about a servant in the Old Testament, it's that they were poor. They were poor. So Isaiah says, he nay, or the Hebrew word, behold, my servant will what? Will prosper. How does a slave prosper? Well, that's a mystery, but it really, right from the start, presents two different portraits of the servant of the Lord. One, the servant is poor and humble. Secondly, the servant will prosper. The servant has wealth. And so we understand that there are two images here of the servant of the Lord. One is that the servant is poor, and the other is that the servant has so much of this world's uh, goods. You know, one of the issues for Jewish people, when we talk to Jewish people about the Lord, is that Jewish people have no concept of two comings. Jewish people believe there's only one coming, and the one coming is of a Messiah who will reign as king. So there's actually no real concept of a Messiah who would suffer and die. And so what we have here is really, really incredibly important. We have a Messiah who, in effect, has two, um, sort of two forms. One, he is poor, and the other is he is uh, wealthy. And so, uh, like uh, Mike Rodelnik, my, my, my wife, Sahava, who's a Jewish believer, would sometimes, when she was young, ask her mom for uh, two things. She wanted a bicycle and a pony. I guess she and Michael Rodelnik had this in common, a fixation on bicycles. Um, Jewish kids like bicycles, like Gentile kids. And so her mom would tell her the same thing. Honey, when Messiah comes, you'll get a bicycle and a puppy. Now, I did get her the puppy, and I'm not the Messiah, but she's still waiting for the bicycle. (laughs) But again, Jewish people put everything that Christians believe about the second coming into the only coming. And so what Isaiah says here is startling, so that when you share the gospel with a Jewish person, and they say, well, I don't believe in a, a two comings. I don't believe that the Messiah will, will suffer and die. You can bring them to this passage and say, well, then how can a servant prosper? And in other words, Isaiah, God through Isaiah the prophet, is the one who came up with the idea of two faces to the Messiah, two images to the Messiah, two modes to the Messiah, but in reality, as we see the fulfillment, two comings of the Messiah. And then uh, Isaiah says he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. The last time that was stated in the book of Isaiah was in chapter 6, in the commissioning of Isaiah, where Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and greatly exalted, and his train, his robe, filled the temple. So the last time this phrase was used by Isaiah, was it was used as a reference to God himself. So we have two images of the Messiah, a servant who will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just like God himself. And then the prophet says, just as many were astonished at you, so my my people, so his appearance, his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. The Hebrew very descriptively uses terms that refer to almost physical disfigurement on the part of this servant. And so here's the executive summary. My servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted like God himself. But on the way from humility to exaltation, from poverty to wealth, from first coming to second coming, on the way, he will be marred and scarred and disfigured. That's the executive summary. And then we learn in verse 15 that he will sprinkle many nations. The Hebrew word for sprinkle is a wonderful term. It's borrowed from Leviticus chapters 1 through 7 and does not refer to water. It refers to atoning blood. You will sprinkle the blood on the altar, same Hebrew word. So it's a metaphor. He will sprinkle many nations. 
In other words, it's not just Jewish people who have atoning blood sprinkled on them so that they can be cleansed from their sins, but it will be the nations as well, because this Messiah, this servant, this one who will be lifted up and exalted and marred and scarred would not simply sprinkle atoning blood upon the Jewish people, but upon the nations of the world. For me, this is somewhat of the Old Testament uh, version of John 3, 16, where God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. The good news, the gospel, is not just for the Jewish people. It's through the Jewish people for the world. Then kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what they have been told, they will, uh, they will see, and what they had not heard, they will understand. And so it's really uh, astounding to the earthly potentates to see that uh, there is a, a movement where individuals, even their own earthly subjects, are worshiping a heavenly king to such a degree that they're willing even to give their lives on behalf of a king that could not even be seen, an invisible king. And kings of this earth simply can never understand our devotion as believers to our invisible yet coming king. And so Isaiah starts chapter 53, one with a great question. And I think I'd like to answer it. Maybe you can answer it too. So who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord uh, been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, a root out of parched ground, no stately form of majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. There was nothing about Jesus in his first coming that would make him appear to be a king or make him attractive to other people. In fact, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, one from whom men hide their face. He was like a leper because it was a leper from uh, whom men hid their faces. He was despised even, and we didn't esteem him. He was rejected. There was nothing about him that was attractive. And yet we learned something further, that he died for our sins. It's almost as if the eyes of the Jewish people are opened in, in a moment. We see that in Zechariah 12.10, that there will be an end time turning of the Jewish people to Jesus, they will look unto me whom they have pierced. And there's also, this is also reiterated by Paul in Romans 11, 25, where he says, all Israel will be saved. In other words, all Israel will turn to Jesus. There's a day coming when the nation of Israel's eyes will be open to the Messiah. But for now, it's individual Jewish people like Michael, like me, like Dr. Brown, like Rich Flashman, like many of you who now see that Jesus is the Messiah. He himself bore our griefs and sorrows. Yet we thought he was stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. We were wrong. In fact, he was pierced through for our transgressions, our rebellions, crushed for our iniquities, the crookedness of our soul, literally. The chastening for our shalom, well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. In other words, it wasn't he that deserved to suffer and die. It was we who deserve to suffer and die. In verse 6, we have an incredible definition of sin. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity, the crookedness. In other words, if the law is a straight line, we are all crooked, bent, and misshapen. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and afflicted. He didn't open his mouth like a lamb led to a slaughter like a sheep silent before its shearers, so he didn't open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? Again, he died in our place. We deserve to die because we are sinners. He was perfect. He deserved to live and to inherit uh, all eternity. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He was perfect according to the law, 
we are not perfect according to the law. He should never have died for his, he would not be able to die for us if he was not perfect, but he was perfect. And so he was a perfect sacrifice. He died for our sins, but he didn't remain dead. The Lord was pleased to crush him, to put him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. In other words, this Messiah servant would be marred and scarred and disfigured, and ultimately he would die as a perfect sacrifice for our sins, but he would not remain dead. He would rise from the dead, and he would see his Zerah, his offspring, prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will fall upon him as a result of the anguish of his soul. He will see it and be satisfied. How can he see it if he was dead? In other words, this servant Messiah, he died. Absolutely, he died, but he didn't remain dead. He crushed death under his feet and rose from the grave. And you and I will rise with him one day if we believe in him. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong. Again, resurrection, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. Let me close with the great apostle Paul, one of the great messianic Jewish leaders of the first century who gave us a little commentary on Isaiah 53. He said, therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ. God was entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of, of Christ, the Messiah, be reconciled to God. And here's, here's the commentary. He made him who knew no sin, the be sin, on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And if you're watching the Zoom event this evening, if you have never accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, now's the time. He made him to be sin for you, and he took away your sin through his death, and he rose in power so that by accepting him, we might have the righteousness of God, and you can have God's righteousness and peace and joy if you turn to Yeshua. And I pray that you will do that. God bless you. Thank you, Rich Flashman. Dr. Flashman, it's over to you.